Hello again, friends. You know, I'm amazed at how much truth you can dig out of Scripture as you follow the rules of biblical interpretation when we rightly divide the word of truth. However, we need to realize that we have to rely on the Holy Spirit to give us the understanding. So today, may God's Spirit give us insight into two little words, I thirst. Now, of all the sayings of Christ on the cross, this one appears to be the least significant of all. But I hope you'll understand that it is every bit as remarkable as any of his other statements from the cross. And I have to add, I think it is also one of the greatest ironies of the Bible, because here is the one who brought water out of a rock to satisfy the thirst of a couple of million Israelites in the wilderness. He's the one who said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink, in John chapter 7 and verse 37. He told the Samaritan woman at the well, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. How ironic that right now, as he hung on the cross, he cried out, I thirst. Listen to John chapter 19 and verses 28 and 29. It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Now when we think of Christ's suffering, most of us think about the physical beatings and the abuse that he suffered. But you remember last week we looked at the spiritual agony of Jesus when he felt abandoned by God on the cross as he was bearing the penalty for our sin in his own body. But it's worth noting that this is really the only statement he made concerning his physical condition. He said absolutely nothing of his physical pain when they scourged and beat him, nor when they pressed that thorny crown on his head or when they drove the nails into his feet and his hands. In fact, Isaiah 53 and verse 7 tells us, as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. But here he says, I thirst. Just two words, but the text reveals several things about the Lord Jesus. First of all, it shows that Jesus was still aware and in control of his faculties. It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, after this, After what? Well, after the worst of his suffering had passed, he's near the end now. After being beaten and scourged and crucified, hanging on the cross for six hours, bearing the wrath for our sin, and he is near the end. After everything he had been through, you would think that he would be absolutely delirious by now. The average person would either be unconscious or at the very least would have no control over the mental state that they have. But the word used here for knowing is the word edo, which means literally he was fully aware. In other words, Jesus had his full senses about him. Despite what others may think or imagine, he was in complete control of the situation. He was fully aware that what he endured was sufficient to satisfy the righteous requirements of the law for sinful men. He knew what he had come to do, and throughout the whole ordeal, he was completely lucid. And he knew the time had come to give up his life. He knew that everything that needed to be done to make salvation available to sinful men had now been accomplished. In fact, these seven statements actually reveal an air of victory throughout the crucifixion. And he had to be alert when these events transpired. He had earlier refused the gall because then it was given to him to deaden his pain and Christ would not allow his sensibilities or his vicarious suffering to be dulled, uh, his senses to be dulled. And because he was in control, he was also aware of the prophetic schedule that he was on. That's the second thing, his perfect sensibility. Jesus knew that he was fulfilling prophecy, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Here's one more utterance that was foretold in messianic prophecy. 
Now, it's obvious that Jesus said these words because he was really thirsty, but we also need to acknowledge that it was a fulfillment of prophetic scripture. Just like Psalm 22 and verse 1 was fulfilled when Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But in verse 15, it also describes one of the physical effects of the crucifixion. It says, my strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws. And if we looked at Psalm 69, we'd see the psalmist makes another prophetic statement relative to our text in John 19. It says, they also gave me gall for my food and for my thirst. They gave me vinegar to drink. That's Psalm 69 and verse 21. So when he said, I thirst, they dipped a sponge in a bowl of sour wine. They put it on a branch of hyssop and they put it to his mouth. It was a kind of vinegar wine mixed with water. It was the cheapest drink of that day. It was the drink of the common man. It was the drink of the Roman soldier. Whenever the soldiers went out to do their work, they carried it with them to keep them from getting parched. But they didn't realize that they were helping another messianic prophecy to be fulfilled. R.C.H. Linsky writes this. He says that the entire scriptures and all that they present concerning the earthly work of Jesus have now been turned into actuality. The work mapped out by scripture is now a work actually accomplished. Loved ones, one of the strongest proofs that the Bible is the word of God is fulfilled prophecy. These Psalms were written roughly a thousand years before Jesus was crucified. J. Vernon McGee says that there were 28 prophecies alone that were fulfilled by the crucifixion of Jesus. And so he knew that this statement would bring a response from the soldiers that will fulfill more scripture. Now, let me also make a comment about the hyssop, because there's some symbolic meaning here. The soldiers put the sour wine on hyssop, which is a, a long reed with a bushy end. Hyssop is significant to all Jews because it takes them back to the scene in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 22. The angel of death was going to pass over Israel, and God said to the people of Israel, take hyssop, dip it in blood, and strike the blood on the doorposts and the lentil. So anytime hyssop appears to the Jewish mind, it is reminiscent of this great sacrifice that took place by the Passover lambs, because now the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb, is being sacrificed. King David also refers to hyssop in Psalm 51 when he said, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. So it's fitting that hyssop should be a tool at the sacrifice of the final and greatest Passover lamb. So there is this symbolic representation of the cleansing that we receive by the blood of the lamb. So Jesus had his perfect sensibilities about him through the crucifixion, and he knew he was fulfilling prophecy. Finally, we see that Jesus was identifying with our humanity in his suffering. Earlier in Matthew 27, as I mentioned earlier, we read that the soldiers had offered him sour wine with gall, but then he refused to drink it. He refused because it was a narcotic meant to dull his senses and lessen his pain. But he wanted his full mental faculties for the suffering that he had yet to endure for us. But now, at the completion of his suffering, which came immediately after this, as we'll see next week, he cried, I thirst. This is the humanity of Jesus on display. He was unbelievably thirsty and dehydrated. He had suffered an incredible loss of blood, exposure, heat exhaustion, severe hydration. He's been on the cross now for six hours. And so the sweat was mixing with his blood and it was just pouring out of him. And the heat of the midday sun now beat down on him after the darkness had subsided. The flies would have been buzzing all around him. One commentator describes the effects of dehydration this way, saying, first, it gives you a fever. Then it gives you a terrible throbbing pain in your head and then cramps in your abdomen. And then nausea sets in. Then your eyeballs begin to dry up in the sockets. And then your lips begin to go dry. And then your tongue gets swollen and thick. And then your throat feels like sandpaper. Your vocal cords swell up. In the end, you can barely whisper. It doesn't sound like human words. It sounds like an animal croaking. No wonder Jesus was thirsty. So 
the physical agony that he was suffering was symbolic, really, of the spiritual suffering of hell. The Bible speaks of hell as a place of unquenchable thirst. In Luke chapter 16, our Lord told about a man who died and he woke up in torment. In his agony, he begged for someone to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this flame in Luke chapter 16 and verse 24. People who are in hell today are crying, I thirst. Because hell, you see, is a place of eternal thirst and suffering. Those who are condemned to suffer there for eternity will forever thirst, not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually. And we just can't imagine how awful it would be. But now, loved ones, there will be no thirst in heaven. Revelation 7, 16 says, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. In fact, Revelation 22, 17, which is the last invitation in the Bible, invites all who thirst to come and take the water of life freely. The question for us is not, do you thirst? Because all mankind has a thirst for fulfillment, for satisfaction. There's a thirst for God that we often fail to realize because we try to satisfy this thirst with things like alcohol and sex and prestige and fame and money. And we try to find somewhere to quench our thirst for satisfaction in life at all the wells of the world. But we don't want to come to the one who gives living water so that we'll never thirst again. It was Pascal who said, there is within us the infinite void that can only be filled by an infinite object. That is to say, only with God himself. You can carry on lost in sin, drinking from everything that the world has to offer. We'll try to avoid God because we pursue all kinds of sinful attractions to satisfy us. But loved ones, you will only end up thirsting for all eternity. Only Jesus can give us living water, friends. And if you've never come to that well that never runs dry, call on him, please, for salvation today. If we know the Lord Jesus is our personal Savior, we, we have drunk of the water that Jesus gives. Listen to what he said to the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. But the water I give them takes away thirst altogether. It becomes a perpetual spring within them, giving them eternal life. That's John 4.14, 4, but that's the New Living Translation. Loved ones, this plea confirms to us that there was a man on the cross, someone who was able to carry our sin in his own body, someone who had no violations of God's holy law himself. Therefore, God made this man who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might have his righteousness. I found this quote, but I don't know who said it, but I love it. It says, far more than pains that racked him then was the deep longing thirst divine that thirsted for the souls of men, dear Lord, and one was mine. Amen. Thank God that he suffered agonizing thirst because he was thirsty for our souls. He thirsted so that we might never have to thirst again. Pray with me. Our Father, thank you for giving us your son. Forgive us, Lord, for drinking so often at the wells that never really satisfy. May we realize that Jesus suffered intense thirst so that we could avoid the eternal thirst and suffering of hell's fire. As the deer longs for the water, may our souls long for you and discover that in Jesus we will find the refreshment for our souls that satisfy us like nothing else can. And we will praise you forever, thanking you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining me, friends. Just remember, when you put Jesus at the center of your life, you are drawing from a well that can never run dry. Amen. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time. Bye.